Hello and welcome to our final Christmas Facebook Live, The Chemistry of Christmas. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook, uh, give us a like and hello to all those watching on YouTube afterwards. Uh, we're here with a very special guest. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Dr. Catherine Haxon. I'm a senior lecturer in chemistry here at Keele University. Fantastic. Um, we've got lots of lots of things to look at again, lots of visual props. Uh, but first of all, shall we, shall we uh, pull a cracker just to, just to get us started? Yeah, we should start. And if you heard, if you were listening out there, you may have heard a little crack. Uh, and I think, first of all, you're going to tell us what puts the crack in crackers. Yeah, so you're probably used to looking at them when they're um, quite broken up. But if we actually look at a cracker snap, it's quite a simple mechanism for something that goes with a definite bang. So you've got two strips of card and they're stuck together with a little piece of binding in the middle. And what you have on one side is something very similar to sandpaper, a really rough surface. And on the other side, you have a chemical called silver fulminate. So it's got an atom of silver, an atom of carbon, one of nitrogen, one of oxygen. Now it's a really, really sensitive explosive. So sensitive that if I had some of the powder on the desk, I could touch it with a feather and it would detonate. So it's driven by turning all of those atoms into new chemicals, things like nitrogen. Those aren't particularly harmful. And what happens when you pull it is you rub the sandpaper against the silver fulminate Ooh. and it goes with a crack. <laughs> that was a lot louder than inside the cracker. <laughs> yeah, well the cracker muffles it a little. Now that's an incredibly small amount. You can see the black bits where the reactions happened. And that's all that was that was in there. Yeah, um, crackers have been around for a really long time. Um, they were actually invented by a sweet shop owner who wanted to make his sweets be more exciting at Christmas. He was inspired by French sweets where they had sugared almonds wrapped in pretty paper. And he thought, hmm, I'm, I'm going to get a bit of a, a leg up in the market. I'm going to make them more exciting. So he started out putting loads of mottos in them, which is why we end up with the cracker jokes. But then he was inspired by his log fire and the cracks that were made as the logs burned. Oh, I see. Because they weren't selling very well. And he was really trying to get a competitive edge, so he thought, if I make the packets crack as they open, that'll add excitement and everyone will want my product. Like this warm winter fire kind of feel. Yeah, so that this was about 1850, and since then they've evolved to be these cardboard tubes with the silver fulminate snaps, and obviously the hat, the really bad joke. Oh, to show, to show you have the joke. Go on. So, uh, what dog can't bark? No idea. A hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. So is um is this type of explosive used in other m sort of bigger explosions? So the ironic thing about that explosive is it's too explosive to use. So there is a whole category of chemical compounds that are too dangerous to use. We wouldn't be able to store it on a big enough scale. Because it's just too sensitive. Yeah. If you can detonate with a, fe a feather, how could you load it into, for example, ammunition, load it onto planes or into guns? It would just be too unsafe. So it's twin, which instead of having silver has mercury. So mercury fulminate has been used as detonators. So the small bit of explosive that sets off the bigger secondary explosive. Right. But that stuff, um, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit too, too wild. dodgy. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, it's, it's definitely on my list of chemicals I would never want to encounter outside of a cracker. But inside the cracker, yeah, fair enough. Fascinating. Uh, okay, great, that's the, the, the science behind crackers. Um, should we have a look at snowflakes next? So, yes. uh, in particular, how many arms do snowflakes have? So, some chemists and some people, when they're wandering about town at Christmas, get really, really irritated by Christmas decorations. And one thing we find ourselves doing is we find ourselves counting the number of arms on snowflakes. <laughs> and I know it's not top of your priority list when you're walking about the shops thinking, I have to get that gift. But snowflakes have six arms. They don't have eight. They don't have four. They have six. Stars might have five or six, but snowflakes have six. And the reason behind that is all about how the snowflake is actually formed and the water molecules in it. So I've got some models here. Mm -hmm. So I've got some water molecules here. And we've got two hydrogens, because the formula is H2O, and one oxygen in the middle. The atoms aren't actually coloured, it's just for the model. And you can see it's got a sort of bent shape to it. Now, as water f cools and starts to freeze, 
these line up so that the hydrogens are always close to the oxygen mm -hmm. and the oxygen's close. So you end up with a certain shape forming. Now if we go to my big model here that's the same colour scheme, you can see the water molecules have been arranged and if you look down the centre here you can see how they're starting to form a hexagonal shape. Oh yeah. Now chemists are really interested in the way molecules are oriented, where they sit in solids and it can have a massive impact on the properties it has. Now for snowflakes they align themselves into hexagonal shapes and that means that and on a tiny, tiny atomic scale, they start forming little hexagons. And that means that snowflakes, which is, are just large clumps of ice, frozen water, they also have to carry on the shape. It basically just reproduces itself throughout the whole crystal. So if you see at the heart of this one, this has got a, a basic a hexagon shape in the middle. Mm -hmm. Now, under certain conditions, that's what your snowflake will look like. It won't have the arm. So if it's not too cold, and there's not a lot of water, it just forms a hexagonal plate. But if the conditions are right, you start to get what are called dendrites, so the tree-shaped ones, which is all the term dendrite means, tree-like, coming off from it. And you might have noticed them in the morning on your car windshield, when you see those beautiful patterns of ice. Yeah. And that's basically all because of the water crystallising in a certain way, but always roughly hexagonal shapes. And it's consistent every time. Yeah, well, they say they say every snowflake is unique. Impossible to prove, because there's no way we could crack them all and analyse mm -hmm. them. But because of the random processes of all these tiny little molecules, I mean, there's going to be millions and millions, if not billions, of water molecules in a snowflake. The chances of them all lining up the same twice are really slim. Yeah. Now, snowflakes are different to other crystal solids you might see. If you're going to put salt on your Christmas dinner, that crystallises into cubic shapes. Mm -hmm. So if you look at sea salt, that's the best one because it usually comes in bigger crystals, you'll be able to see the square shapes. It's easier to look at because it's not going to melt on your finger. And sugar, particularly demerara sugar, you'll see the sort of more square shapes of that. So snowflakes absolutely have to have six sides. <laughs> and if you want to drive a chemist or some scientist crazy at Christmas, give them a Christmas gift with snowflakes that don't and just watch them despair. <laughs> and you were saying there is a, there's a coffee shop on campus that currently uh, yes. has got their snowflakes wrong. Yeah, they've got some round pictures on their window and I was counting this morning and they have some that are right and they have some that are wrong. Oh no! <laughs> and I think, that, I think that bothered me more. I could, I could have accepted it if they'd just been wrong. And, uh, and one last question on snowflakes. Uh, in each snowflake, is there a town of people um, living inside? Uh, singing songs. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. That'd oh. be really scary. <laughs> I think it'd be brilliant. <laughs> uh, brilliant. That's snowflakes then. So um, they've always got to have six arms. Yes, it's 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 just a rule. <laughs> um, and on to another Christmas classic is tinsel, which I'm told is a bit passe these days. Yeah, I mean it's a controversial one, tinsel. Whether you put it on your tree or not, um, some people are sticking with it, and a lot of people have almost moved away from it now. Well, um, I'm, I'm definitely in the sticking with it camp, but my two kittens have other ideas <laughs> and the tinsel regularly winds up on the floor. So tinsel used to be a real sign of prestige. It used to be a sign of wealth and extravagance to have tinsel on your Christmas tree. So back in maybe the 1800s, when it started to become fashionable in Britain, it was actually made of precious metals. So you'd have maybe silver deposited on copper, maybe gold. And it wouldn't be the tinsel that we have today, the sort of bushy kind, maybe with random stars. Mm. It would be long, thin strips of metal and you'd drip them individually over the branches of your Christmas tree. And it was supposed to mimic the effect of icicles. Right. So this was back when we still had proper cold winters and people dreamt of a white Christmas. So the tinsel mimicked the icicles. And the good thing about some of the metals they used, they never tarnished, so every year they always looked beautifully shiny. But silver, gold, very, very expensive things to just take out of the cupboard once a year to put on your Christmas tree. So scientists experimented, inventors probably more, experimented with other kinds of materials. And they came up with tinsel made of tin strips that they then, or lead strips that they then deposited other metals on. So it would be lead because it's quite flexible and mm. heavy, so you got that lovely drape, 
and then they put tin on top, which was very shiny. Obviously, the origin of the term tin, Sparkle, can, yeah. tin can. But by about the 1960s, can health concerns about lead compounds and lead in general were starting to grow, and they were starting to phase out things like lead paint, and you know, ultimately it led to le lead being removed from petrol. And they discovered that, well, tinsel, kind of sparkly, it's on people's Christmas tree, and children have a habit of chewing it. So without making a big deal, because they didn't want the public to stockpile the tinsel that was actually made of lead, they started replacing it with other things. And the first thing they reached for were polymers, so yeah. plastics. And if you look at the patents in the 1950s and the 60s, they're really innovating. And some of the patents were to make iridescent tinsel out of a special blend of polymers. So it sort of gave that pearlescent, iridescent finish. Nowadays, they tend to be more made with things like polyvinyl chloride. So the same thing as cling film. And then it's often coated with aluminium metal and then coloured. And the way they coat it is a little bit strange. They actually heat the metal up so it forms metal vapour and it's then deposited in an incredibly thin layer. So you wouldn't think playing around with this tinsel, particularly the stars, because they're very flexible. Mm. There's nothing in it to tell you other than the shine that there might be metal involved. No, I would think that's completely plastic. Yeah, so it's obviously got the plastic thread in it. Yeah. But it is metalised plastic, which makes it an absolute nightmare if you're going to recycle it. So if you've got mm. a stash of tinsel, you're better off putting it on your tree. And all those little bits that fall off that you sweep into your bin, they are actually going to be microplastics. I see. So you, you do, I think you need to be careful if you're going to buy things like this, especially if you're going to be trying to avoid the plastics. So it may be a good a good thing that tinsel is, is seen as less desirable yes. than it was in the luxur in luxurious days of draping large pieces of metal on your tree. <laughs> yes, well, when I was, I was looking into this a little bit more and they've managed to find biodegradable glitter yeah, uh, yeah. Because you can yeah, get yeah. edible glitter, but there's a biodegradable one made with a eucalyptus tree extract that, again, has the aluminium on it. But there's also biodegradable or natural alternatives made of shiny minerals. Mm. But for tinsel, because we want the flexibility, the length, the strength, there's not that many alternatives. And I guess if you were keeping it for a long time, it's, it's a worthwhile use of that material but like you say these bits fall off and they they're just yeah. they then are like you say microplastics and will end up in all sorts of places well if you if you're one of these people that changes your christmas decor or color scheme every year don't go for most, tinsel yeah it's not the most environmentally friendly but i realized as i was unpacking them my christmas tree decorations some of my tinsel is older than i am because it came from my grandma and i bet it still holds it still, holds all its color and shape it and holds a lot better than the modern varieties. The stuff I've bought in the last five years, they, it's starting to look a bit worse for wear. Right. The older stuff is a lot better. It's not the leaded stuff, though. <laughs> I, I did check. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you need sparkle at Christmas, but just recycle your sparkle. Uh, yeah, exactly. Brilliant. Um, and then finally, how can, how can chemistry help us have a white Christmas? Well, I think we've about, just about given up on the weather giving us a white Christmas. Yeah. I mean, the chances are pretty we were slim. We are very lucky last year. That by now, it, we'd had at least three or four snow days. Yeah, we'd had some brilliant yeah. snow. Now, there's two different types of things that can help us have a white Christmas. There's artificial snow and there's fake snow. And okay. they sound like they might mean the same thing. Yeah. But they don't. So artificial snow is when you take ice and you grind it up really finely and you spray it out and it falls like snow. So that's how they top up ski runs during the Olympics. They have machines that generate snowflake type things. So it's real snow but made artificially? Yeah, it's water just made artificially. Yeah. It's like the stuff that cakes your freezer. Yeah. That you pull off when you're, you're pulling out your ingredients. But what do you do if the temperature is not low enough for that? So it's going to have to be close to zero for that to hang around. Well, you can buy a lot of products called things like Insta Snow Powder. And this is where the chemistry comes in. This is literally just a fine white powder. And what we'll do is we'll put some of it in this flask. I always have to make sure my aim's good because I tend to get this everywhere. <laughs> and what we've got in here is we've got another, it's another polymer. So one of the components of plastic. And this is sodium polyacrylate. 
which is a complicated word to say, there's lots of sodium atoms in it and a polymer called polyacrylic acid. So what we can do is we can add some water And what you can see immediately is it, it starts to swell. And as it swells, obviously, it's increasing in volume because it was just two wee spoons I put in there. And you can see that it's starting, well, on the top at least, it really does yeah. look a lot like snow. It is. Now what happens sort of to the molecules, you can think of the polymers as being really long chains almost think of it like a gigantic beaded necklace. Mm -hmm. And when it's solid without water, it's all scrunched up on itself. But when you add the water, it expands. Okay. And the water, we call the process swelling, and then you wind up with something that looks like snow. And now it's quite free flowing. Now if you touch it, I'm not gonna tip this out, because if I get this all over the place, I will be in trouble. It's not cold. Which, yeah, no. The glass is cold, but it's not cold like a flask ice. full of ice would yeah. be. Now, this is sometimes used for artificial ski slopes and artificial sleigh um, sledging slopes when they're indoors, because you can contain it all in a building. And I suspect some of those, um, you know, the big clear spheres that you can go get your photo taken in the snow scene ones, they probably use something similar to create their snow. And so this is, obviously, if this, does this just not disappear now? This will no, just no, stay? That, I mean, basically, it's easier to think of it as a plastic. Yeah. That's now persistent. So if this was outside, it would just blow around forever and ever and just... Blow around. It doesn't naturally biodegrade easily. Yeah. So it would take a very long time to completely disappear. Yes. Yeah, so if I, what, well, the first thing that's going to happen to it is it's going to dry out. So right. the water will slowly evaporate from it, assuming it doesn't go mouldy first. And eventually, if I dried it really carefully, I could probably decrease its volume back to what I took out of my pot. Oh, okay. And then each time you put water back on it, it would then expand again. Should do. Everlasting snow. Yeah. It's like some Willy Wonka invention, isn't it? Well, it's like the stuff in some ways you get in snow globes. Yeah. But that, that's often glitter now, but that used to be a chemical called benzoic acid. Should I, if I pour a bit of this? You, you can pour it onto your hand. It is safe and non-toxic, so obviously it's designed as a toy, so the, the world doesn't end if you eat it. And it is cool, but that's just the water, isn't it? Yeah. It's all, it's got a feel of snow. It, it, it's a bit spongy. Yes, mm. it's, it's one of the better ones. Uh, we call those kind of polymers super absorbent because they have absorbed a large amount of water. And similar polymers to that are what makes nappies absorbent. Oh, I see, okay. So some, some people do make fake snow by cutting open nappies. But that, those tend to be larger chunks and they're not quite as And vice versa, if you, were, if you were really in a sticky situation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's brilliant. That's really good. And that's how we have a white Christmas thanks to chemistry. Yeah, so you can... And do people... Is this the sort... You know when people spread this across their windowsill? Um, it's not quite the same as the spray-on stuff. No, but you could you could use this as a decor decorative thing. Oh, yeah. It would hoover up. Uh, it's obviously not the most environmental, environmentally friendly no, snow. But you, um, you, could make, you could make a wee Christmas scene with it yeah. quite easily. That's great. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. It's all been fascinating. And... Um, so is this the sort of things that you do on the course? Obviously not all Christmas themed all year round, but sort of... No, we'd, we'd, we'd be teaching our students to explain why w water forms six-sided snowflakes and so they understand what the molecules, the polymers in that are doing Fantastic. as part of the course. And occasionally we let them do fun things. <laughs> Only now and again, though. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who's watched. I uh, hope you have a great Christmas. Uh, thank you for watching our live streams if you watch the other ones as well. Uh, and we'll see you very soon.